happy day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Well, this morning, we have a special treat, and our speaker this morning is Mr. Steve Medlin. And Steve has been a lifelong United Methodist, and he is a member at Epworth United Methodist Church right here in Concord. He has served on various boards and committees in that church, and he is also the teacher of the Seeker Sunday School class there. He is certified with the United Methodist Church as a lay speaker, and he has achieved both his basic and advanced certifications in the lay speaking ministry. Steve graduated from the University of North Carolina in Charlotte and achieved his law degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Steve is married to Deborah, his wife, and he has three adult sons. And in our community, Steve is an attorney here. He practices general law right here in Concord. He's a member of the Concord Rotary Club, has been involved in various other organizations and causes in our own town for over 35 years. Steve says that speaking here is a real privilege. He grew up right here in Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church. He loves dealing with the people of our church and our community. Steve speaks at a various number of churches in our community and says that there's nothing like coming back home to speak. Steve's talk today will be entitled, Be Strong and of Good Courage. So if you will make him feel welcome this morning, Steve Medlin. Good morning to you all. Good what, what a privilege, what a pleasure to be with you. And what a wonderful service. It is my first time in this room getting to be with any of your services. And what, what a change from the little tiny church where I grew up over the years. Got to do the first service over there earlier today. And again, just a real, real pleasure to be with people that I know and you know, I look out and I see many of you that I remember, but this is my pleasure to be here. I want you to know I enjoyed the band this morning. When you performed the Revelation song, you touched me, folks. That's one of my favorite pieces of music in all the world. I thoroughly enjoy that song. I think it says so much. Again, I'm the one truly honored to be with you. This morning, we're going to be looking at our scriptures and reading Joshua 1, 1 through 9, and just be aware of the historical time that we had here. This is a time when the Israelites were coming out of the desert. The time of captivity was over. The, the time of wandering was over. Moses had died. They were moving into a, just a whole new type of existence, a real time of change for them. Our scripture reads, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give unto them, even to the children of Israel, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all of the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, 
that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now let's go back and look at that scripture again. I think this is very important to us. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Let us pray. Dear, dear God, your children have gathered here. We ask your blessing upon this gathering. We ask that you open our hearts, help us learn together. And I do mean learn together. Thank you for your family, Lord, and thank you for all you give us. Amen. Folks, as we look upon the Israelites at this time, folks going through a lot of change, I think we'll find that they have an awful lot in common with us and we with them. Because they were going from a time of familiarity, knowing what was happening, to a time of unfamiliarity. A lot of change. I mean, that 400 years of slavery was over, where they had been told what to do all the time, every day, for so long. That's over now. The wandering in the desert, that's all behind them. They were nomads for a long time. People in transition with a new leader. And now God is suddenly giving them blessings and going to make them property owners. Things will be radically different for them. They are going from the familiar to the unfamiliar. And in a lot of ways, we have much, much in common with those people from thousands and thousands of years ago. I mean, consider the past several years in our own country, our own history, when during this time we've had horrendous economic upturnings and, and recession and still going on and may not end for quite a while to come. Two economic crises in just a short time. A war on terrorism that just will not seem to end and again may not end for a very long time. Energy prices, energy crises and, and prices going up, up, up. The weather doing things we've never seen it do before. And of course societal norms being challenged in ways we could not have fathomed even a short, short time ago. I believe that we too are people going from the familiar to the unfamiliar. And yet God says to us to be strong and of good courage, just as he said it to those Israelite people so long ago. And I believe that Joshua 1, 1 through 9, applies to us right now just as much as it ever did to those people of ancient times. And God said, meditate upon the Scripture, go forward with good strength, good courage, and he meant that for us just the way he did for those people of ancient times. I think if you boil that Scripture down, what it really says is get out the instruction manual and read it. That's really what the Lord is saying, is get in my word, stay in my word, never let it depart your mouth, keep it there all the time. That, I think, is the real message. God says the same thing to us today that he did to those people of ancient times. Surrender to me, I'll be with you. Now, some may say that this is an ancient scripture directed to a different people at a different time. I believe that all scripture works together 
I think all the scriptures work together and that God's promises are for all people and for all time. I just don't think that the Lord's word has an expiration date. It's not like a bottle of Pepto-Bismol that you buy down at the drugstore, set it on the shelf and forget about it, and one day it goes out of date and you have to throw it away. God's word is a lot more meaningful and a lot more permanent than that. In fact, let me give you an example. I think this is a pretty good example. I need some volunteers from the audience, though. Uh, question, are Brooke and Ashley Lambert here? If you are, stand up quickly, very quickly, and come talk to me just a minute. Need to talk to you. <laughs> now, which is which? I'm Eric. Okay, then. I'm Steve Medlin. Good to meet you both, but I want you to know something about me. Uh, I was born right after World War II. That, that's not that bad. Uh, <laughs> I'm what's called one of those baby boomers. There are lots of us out there, a whole lot of us. And I will tell you this, that for those of us who stay in the Scripture and those who live by the Word of God, we're going to heaven. Really, we are. I know it. On good authority. But you ladies are too late. You're too young. Your generation is going to be left out. You were born too late in time. I'm sorry for you. I really am. Do you believe that? No. Of course not. You may have a seat. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah. I wish you could have seen their faces up close like I did. I mean, you know. God's promises, God's blessings, God's successes are for every generation. And it is absurd to say that there comes a cutoff point where the Word of God doesn't apply anymore. The Word of God is for all time, for all generations. Jesus is not just a Jesus of the New Testament because Jesus is the image of God for all time, for all people, in all the world. And God is always the same for all people. God wants us to be blessed today just as he wanted those people in ancient times to be blessed. And he wanted the good things for the Israelites. He wants those good things for us as well. He wants those blessings in our relationships, all of them. And in our jobs, everyday jobs, to be blessed. He wants our church work blessed. And, and all of our dealings in the marketplace, all those things are to be given the blessings of the Lord. And I think that's why God works so hard to get us to read his word, to stay in the scriptures, and to get on the team with Jesus. I've been thinking lately about getting on a team with Jesus you know, if you've been watching the newspaper, listening to television lately, you hear a lot about this uh, NFL draft that took place where the college players are drafted onto the pro football teams. Well, folks, my ideal draft is to draft Jesus on my team because we need to be sure we're walking with the best player of all time. And truly, truly, when you read the scriptures, you can get on Team Jesus. Get the big guy himself on your team. That's the real draft dream, is to make sure you draft Jesus onto your squad. I mean, read some of the scriptures and, and, and see where they're headed. Uh, John 14, verse 9, uh, when Jesus said to Peter, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Or Matthew 28, 18, during the giving of the Great Commission, where Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Well, we are the inheritors of all of the promises of God. When we experience Jesus, we experience God the Father. And we experience a God that has all power in heaven and and on earth. Remember that God was willing to come to earth 
for us to walk among us to become holy man, yet holy divine also through Jesus Christ. And took all of the sins of mankind upon himself, though he had no sin, he took all the sins of mankind upon us and died for us. What a gift. What an amazing gift. I'm just amazed every time I stop long enough and think about it, to think of that magnitude of gift. But it gets better. Yeah, it gets better. Jesus showed us how to enjoy all the promises and blessings offered to all people for all time. Now, folks, the magnitude of the gift, I think, sometimes misses us because we stand too close to it. We don't back away and think about it, really think about it. It's kind of like, uh, who in here has ever been to New York City and seen the Empire State Building? Okay, lots of us. I mean, if you stand up next to the Empire State Building about a foot away, right there at it, you can't tell how big it is. You have to back away a couple hundred yards at least, sometimes half a mile, then look at that big building, and it stuns you how massive it really is. When we think about the gifts of our Father, even though we've talked about them already, God was willing to ramp it up even more. Yes, it gets even better because God ramped up his commitment to us to a really high level, took us where mankind never dared to imagine itself because Jesus beat the unbeatable, the completely unbeatable, when he rose from the dead. He gained a total victory most total victory that could ever be had in all of history. In fact, I, I'm of the belief that on Easter, at Easter time, Jesus played Satan like a fiddle. I mean, walked him into the biggest trap that could ever be, triumphed in the most magnificent way that ever happened, gained the greatest victory that ever was. I mean, how many of you still have an old paper book dictionary in your home? Anybody? Anybody? I still have one, haven't seen it in years. Uh, the, the, the internet's so much faster, but if, if you were to open up that dictionary, the old paper book, and look up the word victory, I think Jesus' picture ought to be there. That was the ultimate victory, the greatest that could ever be. In fact, Jesus' victory was so great, he knew it was going to be so great. All he had to have was a borrowed grave. A couple of days' worth was all he needed. Sort of like when you go down to the beach for a quick weekend, you don't buy the hotel. You rent a room for a few days, that's all you need. And that's all Jesus needed. His gift was so great and it came so fast. Well, focus with me just a moment on the fact that Jesus did not avoid the fight. He won a complete victory over Satan, and we are offered that same victory. But remember that it's not quite time for the high fives just yet. Don't spike the ball too soon, because you have to do what Jesus did. Jesus did not shy away from the fight. He went into that fight, and we're told to do the same thing, to meditate on the Scriptures to be strong and of good courage, and to fight the good fight. For without that fight, there is no victory. There wasn't for Jesus, there won't be for us. In the scripture we read earlier, Joshua wrote three times to be strong and of good courage. And it is clear that the struggles of life will come to us. There is no question about that. Conflict will come, but conflict is to be met with courage. We're to keep that scripture in us at all times. And remember, conflict is to be met with courage. And remember who's on our side. We're on Team Jesus. We drafted him, remember? He's on our team. Now, folks, I 
I want to tell you a little bit more about my family. I have three adult sons. All three of them went into the military. The older two were U.S. Marines, the youngest one in the Army. And yes, we do have a lot of teasing in my family. The Marines went over to Iraq a couple of times and were involved in the invasion there, also the occupation in Anbar province. They were, there were times they were in battle every day. And I, I was very concerned about them. I would talk to them, and they'd always tell me, Dad, don't worry about it. We're going to win this battle. In fact, they'd say it even more poignantly than that. They'd say, Marines expect to win. We go into battle expecting to win, but we expect to fight first. But remember, we fight with a stacked deck. We fight with an unfair advantage. We have the best weapons, the best training. We have the best communications. We have the best air force. We have it all over the enemy. And I always told my sons, Please always go into battle with an unfair advantage. When we face conflict in our lives, you and me, we go into that conflict with an unfair advantage over Satan. And in fact, I don't think it's an unfair advantage at all. Uh, I think we ought to have the advantage. You folks know what an unfair advantage is. That's when somebody else has the advantage. But we have the advantage, and we're supposed to use that advantage always, all our lives. You see, I don't think we're supposed to spend much of our time wishing life were easier. Life is going to present challenges. We know that. That's part of being here. But we know also that instead of complaining about life being hard, we have the ability to get better and better and better I was in a, an outstanding Sunday school class this morning. Again, learned more. We all had that opportunity to learn more, to get better, to get to working better with Jesus, to walk closer to the source of our strength and the source of that courage. That, I think, is our real commandment, is to stay in the Word, to stay with the Word of God not to spend so much time wishing life were easier, wishing we were better. It's something we can actually do. We can handle that. We've been given the tools. A very, very close friend of mine named George, someone I wish you could all meet, taught me a good lesson some years ago. George is one of those Rock of Gibraltar type guys who's always smiling, always handling the challenges of life well. Some time ago, George lost both of his parents over one weekend. And I still remember being in the receiving line for the first of his parents to die and finding out about the second one who died just a few hours before. And I asked George, you know, how, how are you coping with all this? How are you functioning right now? And he kind of jumped back a little bit. He said, why, Steve, the Christian man never walks alone. I have help, big time help. And folks, I got a heck of a sermon and just a very, very few short words from my friend George, a sermon I've certainly never forgotten. I hope none of us ever forget that sermon because the storms of life will come. The wind will howl and the waves will crash upon us. They will rock your boat the same way they rock mine. And I'm really hoping that all of us, being on Team Jesus, will have the peace of that personal relationship with our Lord. I hope we're the ones who are at peace when the world is being tossed about. Because the storms of life eventually stop. But Jesus, our Jesus, never backs off. Always there, always powerful, always with us, never changes. You see, some folks will, will ask you, and I think they ought to be asking you, why you're so calm in the storm. Because some people are going to focus on the wind, and the wind will blow at you. It will spin you around sometimes. 
Some folks will focus on the rain and the rain will drive on you and wet you to the bone and make you miserable. Some folks will focus on the waves because they will clap together way up over your boat. They will scare you. And some folks will focus hard on the fact that that boat may just overturn one day. But I think we have the ability to stay calm and give a short answer to the question, how do we stay so calm? Look who's in my boat. Look who I sail with. Look who's on my team. Because our Lord Jesus has experience in boats. He's a good sailor. And he's remained calm in storms before. And we get to take him along with us. We get to focus on Jesus. Think about it. We get to focus on Jesus. Not the storm, Jesus. Because his promise is made to all of us. His promises made over thousands and thousands of years Focus on Jesus, not the storm. Go through life like my friend George, who preached the shortest, best sermon I ever heard, and do like George and go with Jesus by your side every, every minute. Don't fight alone. Fight like the Marines with an unfair advantage over the storm. Because our God has promised victory. The scriptures are crystal clear. Our God has promised victory. But we have to fight the fight first. But when we fight, fight with our Lord on our side. Fight with God on our side. And remember, remember to always be strong and of good courage. Let us pray. Our God, dear God, Lord, you walk with us. Help us open our eyes long enough to realize you walk with us. Stay on our team. Help us appreciate who walks beside us. Amen.
give my life to the potter's hand. Take me, mold me, use me, fill me. I give my life to the potter's hand. Give my life to the potter's hand.